in that kind of scenario, people cannot get the kind of services that they need. I mean, even education. I, I, one of the things that the program guys um, are on a track to go home, one of the things that they require people to get their GED. But they can't get the GED because there's a backlog in the educational system. They can't get they just like a one or two year wait list. You know, so volunteering is probably important to make a difference. To give guys who want to get GED, who want to learn how to be, who want to come out of the shadow, who want to uh, stop being stigmatized in other, right? The volunteers are providing that service to so many people. And like I said, I And, uh, but, yeah, learning builds upon, upon itself, so it's about the small successes, you know, and when you see the smile, when you see the glimmer that I, he got it, right? Whether, like I say, I used to see it in guys when they just read a, 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 a really rudimentary sentence, man, I did it, he did it, you know, so it's, you know, that, 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 like for me, it was, relearning it was easy because I, I then the, the successes kind of built my confidence. Then I got pushed to the next level when I got around educated people. And it forced me to educate myself at a, at a higher level in terms of, you know, kind of just catch up, you know. Because, um, I mean, I was in groups or and I, people talking, and I'm like, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. You know, they was talking about education and quoting certain things from history, you know. And so I went back and I, I read all the French philosophers, I mean, all the you know, Renaissance philosophers and all that. So. Just try to catch up with everybody else. And because, um, you know, I was convicted by a criminal justice system. I saw at the time that was racist and really uh, just only saw a young black man sitting in front of them and, you know, just uh, rubber stamp my conviction and convicted me. And, you know, when you get convicted of first or second degree murder in Pennsylvania, uh, it's a mandatory life without parole sentence, right? And so I'm 23 years old, and I go to Greenfield from prison. And this part of the story is really connected to the work that you do, right, as a case, but this is my personal story. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work I did in Greenfield as it relates to tutoring and literacy and those kind of things, right? Okay, so when I get to Greenfield, whenever anybody goes to prison, the first thing they do is they give you a battery of tests, right? They sit you down, and they take a needs assessment of you. They want to figure out where you, where you are, in terms of socially, your educational level, your IQ, your psychological makeup. And I took those tests. And normally when you go into a prison and you do those tests, you're just a statistic, you know, you do them and you just move on, you go into the population. Well, fortunately for me, that didn't happen to me. I wasn't just a statistic. There was a guy in Greenfield Prison, and Mr. Henry Bellow, who was a counselor, he worked there as a counselor. And he was one of the people that administered the testing. And when the results came back, he sat me down. He said, young man, come here, sit down. I don't want to go over your test scores with you. And I said, OK. He said, you're reading at a second grade level. So your math skills are second grade. Your comprehension skills are third grade. And I'm sitting there saying, OK, but you're not telling me anything I don't know. I know I'm dumb, right? And I knew that as a result of a bad experience I had in elementary school. Most time, any of you can think back in your lives and think about a teacher, a parent, a friend, a neighbor, someone who really inspired you towards higher education, to encourage you and inspire you. Well, it was the opposite for me. I went to Robert Morris Elementary School, and, that's, and, that, and that, at that time I had a teacher named Mrs. Gomez, someone who I will never forget because of the impact she had on my life. I called her the equal opportunity humiliator, which she often humiliated children, embarrassed them, and I remember one day we had a, a assembly, a, a, a career day, right? And you know when you have a career day, you have all these professionals on the stage, doctors, police, firemen, and they came up there to give these powerful uh, talks, encouraging people about their particular professions. And I remember vividly when that when that thing was over, I went back to the classroom. Mrs. Bookman said to me, said to everyone. Look, kids, I want, when y'all go home, I want you to sit down and write a paragraph about what you want to be when you grow up. I was happy. I went home, and I, um, and I wrote my paragraph. See, 
when I was growing up, back in, in my neighborhood, there was an older guy, and on his back roof, he had a, a, a telescope. I used to go out there and hang out with him. He used to teach me all about the universe. He used to let me look through the telescope. He used to teach me about the stars and the planets and all that. All, all that. So I wrote my paragraph. That Monday morning when we got back into school, the teacher conducted the, the program. It's just like this. You know, sitting in his chairs, and she would call each student up. Each student would come up, read their paragraph, and at the end, Susie would say, I want to be a nurse. Well, Tommy would say, I want to be a police officer. Well, Mary said, I want to be a doctor. Well, Johnny said, I want to be a fireman. And I sat there anxiously waiting my turn. When my turn came, she called my name. I come to the front of the class. I read my paragraph. I can't really remember what I said in that paragraph, but I know at the end, I said proudly, my head up, that I wanted to be an astronomer. It was kind of like out of left field. Anybody else want to be normal for that? I want I had this big dream of being an astronomer, right? And so, and like she recently looked at me like, an oh, astronomer? Where do you get that notion from? You're not smart enough to be an astronomer. You're not that bright. You know how smart you have to be to be an astronomer? You know, all the kids laughed at me. When all of the kids got applause, I got laughed at. And she said, go back to your seat and come up with something you can ask me to do. I walked back to my seat humiliated, ashamed, and embarrassed. And what I did was, but the impact of that was I kind of internalized that message that I wasn't that smart, that I wasn't that bright, right? So then I said, I lost the value of education. Then I began to tell myself, because we tell ourselves a story even when they're not true. And actually, I could have told myself any story. I could have said, she knows what she's talking about. I'm one of the smartest people in the world. I could have told myself that story. But actually, I told myself the story that I wasn't that smart, I wasn't bright, so why should I go to school? And I, I dropped out of school in the 10th grade. You wonder how the, how the hell did you make it to 10th grade, right? Because I didn't go to school to learn. I just went to hang out with my friends. So that was the impact of my experience in the Philadelphia School District that kind of killed the value of education for me. So. Yes. Uh, so you brought up how, in light of the fact that the prisons and jails aren't investing heavily in education, yeah. then there's space for people as volunteers to come in and support students. Um, and I was just talking with Iris about this actually, but then it creates this challenging situation where we, we really want the students to be getting as much out of the education as possible and we want our, like what we bring to be as high quality as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, but we also want the facilities to be <coughs> investing more yes. in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of like the better that we get as volunteers, sometimes it feels like the less incentive <laughs> right, the right, facilities right. have to invest because right. like we're yeah. coming in for free and doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you like deal with that? Yeah, issue? but that that is that, that you know, because what I know about prison systems I mean, even with Inside Out, the first thing they say is, is it free? Yeah. <laughs> it is free. Oh, yeah, it was free. Oh, yeah, Honestly, absolutely. Yeah, I feel like that's a big you know part of how we get in the door for <laughs> Yeah, right, right. It's called it's free. Yeah. Right? And, you know, and that is one of the fallacies of, um, of doing this kind of work because the system in this economic, in economic times where people are so adamant that no taxpayer money should be invested in mm -hmm. education, they welcome uh, free stuff, because nobody wants to step outside of the box and say, man, we need to invest more in education in prisons. I mean, Obama has taken that step, and I think that's eventually that's going to filter, that, that's going to filter down, um, you know, over the next couple of years, but, you know, it's very difficult, and one of, I think one of the things you can do is <clears throat> begin to put together statistics to show that the success that you have in but you only go for so far, mm -hmm. right? So it's going to take some investment or, or, or some, uh, 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 a deeper involvement by the state in the educational process so guys can go to the next level, you know? Because you, like you said, you only take a guy so far, right? And, and so, uh, although it's free, if they are, you know, this is the big if, they are really concerned, which I don't personally don't think they are, they're really concerned about a guy doing well and being successful. I mean, that, that should be a little brain. Mm -hmm. right? But I, I think you put together statistics and show uh, where guys are, <clears throat> are are making strides and they just need that extra little push uh, in terms of the next level of education beyond tutoring. Uh, maybe somebody will um, you know, listen. And I think you do that if 
through it, no, it's through the Department of Education, who really looks at it from a different perspective than you know, the people who are concerned about care, custody, and control. You can do it through the political system, uh, state representatives, and city council people. Um, because everybody is in this quandary about what do we do about recidivism, education in prison, and crime. And all those things come together. And people are looking for creative ways of how do we uh, you know, solve these problems. And so. Different, different issues and concerns. I'm finding so many different mentalities different mentality today. It seems hard. It seems challenging. challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is hard. the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. Else is a challenge. Um, um. So. <laughs>